introduce you guys. Please introduce yourselves. Good morning. Um, my name is Paul Byrne. I'm currently the CEO of Currency Fair. So the context for me in this panel is I've had three exits before. So I raised capital from a corporate VC, uh, a VC, and two private equity firms along the way. Uh, and first sale was to a direct competitor. Second sale was to another party in the in trade industry. And the last two were to actually to um, PE firms. So of a broad spectrum. So for this panel, we're going to talk about my experience at Currency Fair and what we're trying to achieve. Fantastic. Good morning. My name is Damien Guermont-Pré. I'm the chairman of Lemonway, a regulated payment institution based in France. We passported our license all over Europe, and we raised money twice from two VCs and from a private equity fund for a total of 35 million euros in the last 12 months. I'm a former, the former uh, CEO of uh, the banking division of Auchan, and I bought a credit card company in between the jobs. And I also, uh, I'm a business angel investing in uh, 25 uh, startups, of which half are fintechs. Fantastic. And had you raised venture money before in all of these things, or private equity when you bought the credit card? When company? we bought the credit card, I did it with uh, uh, Apex Partners. OK. And they were majority owners. So Excellent. it's a very different uh, story. Excellent. Um, so I want to now ask you each for, if you had to make one tweetable statement about what you've learned in, in all your experiences around this journey, do you have something you would say? Thank you for that. <laughs> Sort of pass. begin with the I end in mind. I appreciate that hospital pass. Um, <laughs> I would say the, uh, the f number one thing for me was to really spend time understanding your investors and what their actual requirements are before you start the process. Um, because way too many people are enthusiastic to raise capital. They get in front of a lot of people and they think every meeting equals a term sheet. And you need to really understand, and I would say spend a lot of time diligencing the outlook the expected exits for your, for your investor, and it obviously gets more complicated the later on you get in terms of what their agenda actually is. Excellent. And on myself, I believe it's a full-time job. It takes at least six months, and if you do not have more than that, do it yourself. At, at least you're sure to finish the job. Excellent. Um, okay. So let's dive into some of these questions, and please just throw your hand up if you've got something you want to talk with us about. Um, so I sort of broke questions up into the three sections that, that I think of as fundraising, which is what do you do before you start raising, what do you do during your raise, and then what should you expect after you raise money? Um, so you know, I well, guess I want to start with, when you, when you thought about fundraising, did you think about what you wanted to get out of it other than a check, right? What was your key criteria, right? Since you've both had experience with this before, how did you decide who you wanted to be involved in your company at each raise? Um, we wanted to find investors who, who understand regulated business, a regulated banking or financial services. Uh, when you have a regulator, Everything is more complex. You need tier one, not tier two capital. Uh, it takes longer. We also wanted focus. Frankly, we were developing the company all over the spectrum. And at least with investors, we, we got focus on marketplaces, B2B, B2C, C2C, financial ones. So um, with regard to a follow-up question, um, when you say you wanted an investor with focus, you wanted an investor with regulatory experience, are we talking about the individual at, at a firm that you worked with, or are you talking about the firm overall? The firm overall. Okay. Yeah. So the those firm overall. Those who already invested in a regulated business. Okay. O otherwise, it's too complex to tell them, uh, you, you know, our regulator is uh, looking for... For tier one, uh, so no preferred so you shares. you didn't want to be in the job of educating the investor? <laughs> it takes too long. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, what, what were you looking for? Yeah, well, I, I actually agree with Damien 100%. Like, we're also a regulated business. So yeah. Currency Fair is obviously regulated all across Europe, uh, also in Australia, Canada, Singapore, ho Hong Kong, and we have a couple of licenses that were kind of uh, pending. Mm -hmm. So actually, 
if you have to spend time explaining to a VC what, what being investing in a regulated business looks like, you're wasting your time. Okay. This is my, my starting point because if they don't understand fintech is about regulation and financial services as much as it's about technology, then I think that you're on a loser. Okay. But from point of our point of view, I've only done one fundraising for Currency Fair, mm. and we did that in Asia with an Asian investor because we were entering the Asia market, and we wanted to find a partner who actually was able to help us establish our business. Is we're actually expanding our business into China, so payments payments into China, business payments into China, which actually is a very regulated, hugely regulated business and a very complex business. So we needed somebody in Hong Kong or Southeast Asia who understood Asia-based payments and local Asia regulation, and and had a lot of relationships, because Asia is also more bit bigger in relationships. So we did a lot of work up front to try and segment our list down. So we ended up with a very small list, obviously, of potential investors. And fortunately, we got one of them. <laughs> um, well but, that, but it was a lot of work. Well done. And I can add that um, making sure you find investors who understand regulation means that they will value your license. They will value your compliance team, your rules your processes. Otherwise, they don't care. They just look at uh, the turnover or the traction, etc. Yeah. You see? Very good. Um, we, one of the things I tell my entrepreneurs is it, the process of raising funds is like uh, doing an enterprise sale for your first customer. <coughs> and you need to find someone who is really aligned with what you're selling and values what you're selling so that they will be first, so that they will jump. And I think this point that you've made about understanding regulation, not having to spend time educating the investor. Uh, my follow-up point and the question that I, was, that I was asking before about firm versus individual is especially when you get a firm with a lot of partners that has a great brand name, there may be an amazing partner there who knows software as a service really well. And the investor that does, has done regulated businesses or payments businesses or whatever in the past isn't doing any new investments. And when you work with the partner that's done software as a service, regardless of the firm having done financial services in the past, the partner isn't. So you're still back at stage one for education, which makes it difficult. So how did you, what did you do and how, what work did it take to identify who you wanted to potentially work with. Like, how'd you actually build, tactically, how'd you build your leads list? Did you engage advisors, right? Other entrepreneurs? Uh, we, we, uh, we engaged um, advisors, and I'm not, I won't name any advisors, um, but uh, one of them turned out to be pretty poor. <laughs> and I would, have, I would now have second thoughts about using an advisor, unless it's a very specialized advisor who actually understand, a bit like the investors, who actually understand regulated businesses and the complexity of raising funds and getting approval. Because every, every investor, as Damien will attest to, needs to be approved by a regulator, right? If they own more than 10% now under this new mm. UBO rules in the EU. Um, so for in our case, though, uh, the investor we, we, we have is Convoy Ventures, which is a Hong Kong-based uh, business. They had previously invested in Nutmeg, which is a UK robo-advisor. So they already had made an investment in the UK in a similar regulated business. So we had six others on our list, including some of the bigger Chinese uh, firms, and, and they had already made investments in Europe. But we figured out very quickly from after talking to them directly, ourselves, uh, like entrepreneur to entrepreneur, that their European businesses weren't doing as well as they'd like, and they were pulling back a little bit. And they were yeah. open about it, because if you go through a bank, everybody keeps the whole show moving forward, because a bank wants to actually be seen to be working. <laughs> Whereas if you go directly <laughs> yourself, they do. If you go directly yourself, you basically can pretty much get to the heart of the matter very quickly as a CEO with somebody on the other side, particularly if it's on the business side of the other side, <laughs> as opposed to a corporate a VC who what needs to like see everything. Yeah. Because we have we went to one in particular, large Chinese company, and they actually were genuinely interested. Uh, and then the the girl said, "Well, actually, we are interested, but we're tracking three thousand five hundred companies at the moment." That's all. And we went, okay, so we're number what, three, three, four, nine, nine, or are we number one? <laughs> so she said, look, we're, we're, we're pulling back. We've made a few investments. They're not working out as well as we'd like, but you're on our tracking list. And we said, that's great, you know, happy days, but we're moving on because we want to actually now get into the market. 
So it, you have to really, I think, um, spend a lot of time researching the, upper, the potential investors, and we were lucky. We had a good contact. We actually used a guy who had raised money from uh, for Nutmeg in a private capacity to help us segment the list. So we actually went and paid a guy to, to help us. Got it. At a, as a, an individual, not as a bank, because he was actually, at the time, he was doing a bit of consulting. So we tracked, tracked him down and said, look, would you be interested in doing so some you, research? Did you pay him on, on a consulting fee or, or commission? No, we paid him, uh, paid him commission because, uh, yeah, at the end, we said, look, if this deal happens, we will give you something if it doesn't happen. But if it happens, we'll give you a fee. Basically. Was he licensed? Was like he in the U.S., right? I, I'm, I'm not licensed to raise money, so I can never take a commission to help my companies. Yeah. Well, he, well, he took a consulting fee. He consulted, was okay. <laughs> uh, let me, before, before we go to, to you, Damien, the question. Do you want to follow up on one of these? Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Antoine from a French startup named Jokali. A quick question. What was your maturity stage when you started uh, these, uh, these uh, raising ventures? And a second question. What was your methodology to build these uh, lists of VCs that you were milking afterwards? So the, the stage. Uh, the, to be frank, the company had uh, self-financed its growth for 10 years. Okay, so that was nicely done. That was good. That was good, but we were lacking of focus. We had created a company, a subsidiary in in Africa, and we were not paid at that time. But we were capable of selling our software to banks that were trying to do our job, and that was a way to make money. W but it was a way to create competition too, so that was not clever on the long term. To come back to the question, um, we are building trust. You need to build trust with your investors, and usually you build trust with individuals. I remember that I uh, had contacted Apex Partners to bought a credit card company because the lady had worked at BNP, that was the seller. Kay. So she trusted BNP, at least that their subsidiary in Belgium was good enough. In, uh, in our case, for the Series A, we used uh, an advisor, an advisor, which is which may be dangerous in case you're losing time, uh, because you be you can be stuck in the middle, okay, not yeah. finding the the right investors. And um, we knew we knew the VCs, in fact, that invested at Lemonway. Okay, at least the first one who bought us the second one. We a uh, new Brega, okay, uh, in French VC, yeah, and bought us Speed Invest, okay, okay. based in Austria, Germany, yep. and they, they knew a lot about fintech, yep, a and Brega knew a lot about marketplaces, and since we are fintech servicing marketplaces, okay, it made sense. Good then on the second on the second Series B, we found people who knew about regulation. They had bought regulated companies, such as banks and insurance companies. Yep. They were coming from Anacap, which is another one, another private equity fund investing in regulated business. Yep. And they trusted that the marketplace business was big enough as a sector. Yep. Okay? So it went well. Okay. But without, without advisors on the second time. And I come to this uh, question, it takes time to raise money, right? It's a full-time job. Yeah. So how do you do it if you don't use a, an advisor? <coughs> As a CEO, I was lucky enough to be president, had more time, you see? How did you do it as a CEO? Hey, you basically end up no, no, it's great. Hey, I'd rather have a conversation. It's great. You basically <laughs> end, you end up basically working two jobs, yeah. okay? So you need to have a really good number two. In my case, I, in the currency fair, I have a really, really good CFO who also is a COO. So we were, I was lucky. Okay, um, but your question earlier on was what stage? So Currency Fair is a Series C company. They're my previous business. I actually got money from the PE firm, a high growth PE firm on day one. So because I had, and because they came to me, because I had had a successful exit on the previous deal, that they were an investor in. I didn't, I didn't know they were an investor in a fund that invested in me. Yeah. So they came to me and said, we, like, we made a lot of money the last time. We like what you've done. We know you have a good an idea that you're working on with somebody else because we've heard about it. We want to put money in now. Uh, and, and they were the majority owner, obviously, yeah. right? Because they put all the money in. Uh, and, the very and the previous one was from a CBC, the first one. So a whole mixed bag. But your second question was on, uh, on uh, how do you find the list of investors? 
you, you talk to as many people as you can in your ecosystem and you ask them, who, 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 who would you trust? Who would you recommend? How, what was your experience like? And sometimes people say, I didn't get money from X, but X really understood my business. It just was the wrong time for them or I was too small or I was too big. So uh, you just build your own ecosystem and look at who's investing in, not just your, com not your competitors really, because they won't generally invest in more than one in your space, but people who invest in similar businesses. So like if you're like us, regulated, try and find people who've invested in regulated businesses who understand regulated businesses and who you know, have had maybe one or two exits from similar businesses to yours, so that at least we'll know how to work with you to make you successful. And then find, and then just ask people. I, I wouldn't ask a bank, yeah. by the way. Some of, some of the tricks that I teach my entrepreneurs, one is you can go to sites like CB Insights and PitchBook and Crunchbase, and you can find a, a long laundry list of investors. You can look at the attendance lists and the sponsor lists and the speaker lists of conferences like this and others. And that's where you can begin to build you know, a list of names. Then you have to start to dig into are they the right stage? You know, what kinds of businesses have they as individuals invested in? And that's the process of filtering, right? So it's, it's actually a very long involved process, which is why it's full time. When, you know, you've raised six times? Uh, yeah. Six different yeah. companies? No, four, four, uh, five companies, Kay. six times. Yeah. Okay, so five, in five different companies, mm -hmm. and now you, you both mentioned this, it's a full time job. When did you realize it was a full-time job? <laughs> on the first one. <laughs> on the first one, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah you, get, yeah, you get to know pretty quickly. Now I have to say, I actually found it easier to raise money from PEs or later stage companies than actually at the earlier stage. Yeah. Um, now I was fortunate the last time they came to me, so, um, and in the previous time, they had invested in a, in a partner company of ours. Yep. The, the PE firm had, so it was quite easy to get them over the line because they knew us through, the, through our partner, which happened to be a healthcare business in Tennessee. And so that was easier. I actually find the VC world different because you mentioned earlier, it's like ma an enterprise sale. Yep. I've, I spent most of my life making enterprise sales and selling to a VC is m more difficult because they generally aren't as educated because they're, they're making smaller investments Therefore, they're more thinly spread, right? Yeah. So if you're selling an enterprise sale, the buyer understands this, what the software does. Because otherwise, you wouldn't be in a room talk, you know, selling to them, right, generally. Whereas VCs, I find, unless they're really, really specialized in your particular segment, they are still like, not very, very deep on knowledge. Yeah. With the best will in the Fair world, enough. they're not. So it is actually more complicated and more difficult, I think. And also, and also the difficult part of the job has, the, has been done. And you, I mean, the product, you, you found the product, the market, the traction, the first results, the team, okay? So that's why I think it's, it's more difficult to, to convince a VC than a private equity firm. Yeah. Uh, come back on the, on the list. I went to money 2020, but I, I did not buy any ticket. It was too expensive. I stayed outside, invited by all VCs that were organizing off uh, sessions in the bars, restaurants, so I went uh, to breakfast, lunch, and dinner with yep. VCs, and at the end of the day, it was done. I did not enter twenty twenty twenty. 2020, okay? You just go there to meet VCs. You then sit, I went you sit in the Starbucks, and then you go to the parties. Well, you, invite, you, you make sure to be invited before. You just send an <laughs> email, and that's done, okay? Another way to do it, you, you, you register to Noah, Noah Berlin. I went to Noah Berlin. It's free. You put your pitch, you're selected, and then you, you, you fill in uh, the schedule, and you click on the investors. There are 700 investors online. You just have to filter, to use the filters. As uh, is it a series A, B, C, uh, what, time, uh, what kind of sector, etc. At the end of the day, you don't have 700 investors, but only 80. You invite them, you have uh, 40 interested, and 20 minute meetings in two days. 10 meetings a day, a day, and it's free. Noah, Berlin, or London, or Zurich, it works, I can tell you. Otherwise, I have an, uh, an Excel spreadsheet uh, I can share. Yeah. Questions? We can keep going, or we should keep going. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, how did you 
get to know the VCs? And, and you, right, you both mentioned about developing the relationships. You what did that look like? You make sure that your company is well known and you receive at least every week uh, an email from an analyst from London, New York, or Paris asking for spending half an hour with you on the phone. No, no, no. I mean, once you, you okay. identified oh. an investor you're interested in, yeah. developing the relationship it with takes, them. Okay. After two months, you know if you okay. will receive a letter of intent or not. Okay. okay. How many meetings did well, you have? Well, make sure. I heard the name CFO. Make sure the figures are ready. Yeah. Okay? A and uh, frankly, the pitch you, 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 you make on online, uh, it's short, but you need to make sure you know your figures. Okay, yeah. by heart, <laughs> by heart. Okay. Okay, and uh, this is the most difficult part. Then it's easy, and then you make sure to keep busy your investors, the same way they make sure to keep you busy, okay. so that you do not look elsewhere. Okay. Make sure that they do not look elsewhere too. Okay. Okay. So you you stay connected. Yep. How about how about you, Paul? What do you? Uh, I would say the uh, well. The first thing is you're right. You, you can use things like Zoom and everything just to do the original initial pitch, but you need to meet them face to face pretty quickly to build a relationship. So what we would do is we would then let's say we were going to be in London, because um, we're actually based in Dublin. We would actually arrange to meet people. So if they're not available to meet you, that's a good sign that they're not interested. <laughs> if they're ready to available to meet you, then you can get get into the meat of the presentation or of the business, and then you follow up a few times. Now, th it's a tricky one because if you follow up too frequently, they'll think you're desperate. So you don't want to be seen to be desperate. But I think there's no downside to communicating to them at least once once a week. Uh, to see, And you'll know after a month or two. If they're not engaging with you after a few weeks, then we just move on. Like, you know, no harm, no foul, right? Yep. So either they're interested, not interested. Sometimes it's not for them. Sometimes the meeting didn't go well. And you just and sometimes you just don't know. It could be something else going on, right? Um, so I think you just basically, you have to ba you either put a bit of effort in to connecting with them, talking to them, me meeting them face to face, and then, uh, and then if it doesn't work, drop them. You only have so many hours in the day, you've got to find somebody, right, who actually understands your business. So don't keep chasing the, don't keep chasing the guy who's not responding to you because you, you, you're just wasting your time. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a statement, and I, I want you to react to this. It, it applies to this. So in the U.S., not a lot of people know this, right? Because a startup, when you invest in the early stage, it takes seven to ten years before there's an exit, right? That's just what, what happens. Um, so in the U.S., at least, the average VC relationship, seven years, lasts longer than the average marriage, 5.5 years. So what does that say about how much time you should spend getting to know? Yeah. How do you think about that? You don't? How long does it get to know my wife? <laughs> <laughs> huh? uh, you, you're building trust. Uh, I think the difficult part is that the uh, letter of interest is not binding. Yeah. And the time in r is running. So you may run out of time. Yeah. And then the relationship is no more balanced. Yeah. If you have been married uh, since uh, 30 years, if it works well, it's because it's balanced. Okay, no one is the leader, and uh, I found it difficult at the end uh, with the, the the investors between a, s a letter of intent and signing. Mm -hmm. What happens in case the trust is no more there? They they go apart. I mean, they they, li they leave. So and, you're and you don't have time your anymore. Your pitches should tell the truth. Yes. First of all, make sure you bring news, good news, during that time. Okay. To make the the trust even stronger. Yeah, I I agree. The um, the you have to be clear and on honest. I mean, every, everybody, it's like any sale. You have to put your best foot forward and be optimistic. Because if as a CEO, because if you're not optimistic as a CEO, no one will be optimistic in your business. But if you're over optimistic, or you have numbers which you can never hit you're going to break the trust during the process. So you really want to make sure that you're honest and you outline the risks. You know, like we're, we ourselves are probably going to do something this year because we want to expand deeper into Asia. But we'll, we'll be outlining what the risks are, right, for anybody investing because, you know, you have regulatory risk, you might get a license in time, et cetera, et cetera. So, 
So you have to be clear and, as Damien said, you have to be honest because to, b to keep build and keep the trust. And then if a VC tries to renegotiate that, that for no reason other than they like to get a good deal, that's not a good sign for a long-term relationship, for a seven-year relationship. Yeah. Um, so I would say you have to be honest and upfront. How do you think about um, when you were raising um, the balance between equity, control, like where was your mind at as you were you were raising that? When were you, when were you were concerned about giving up too much? When did you learn actually, you know, which was more important? Yeah, uh, I actually very early on um, just decided that it wasn't about control, because if it becomes about control, as Damien said, the relationship is no longer balanced. If one person has to be in control, you don't have a good relationship. So we early, very early, just said, look, we get a we get the right investor and we build a business. And if this investor turns out to be a bad investor, well, we just have to leave and go and do it again, right? Um, and if we start spending too much time worrying about who's in control here, then we're going to have a bad relationship ultimately overall because we're going to be looking over our shoulder at them. They're going to be looking over their shoulder at us. So we, we were happy to give up control. We didn't need control. We just needed to have the right investor that we had vetted now. Because back to my point earlier, we had done our diligence on the investors. We had figured out who was able to help us, who what their reputation was. We had vetted the individual who'd be on the board as to whether they were supportive. Because th the number one thing you need to really try and, and make an estimate of yourself is how will they react when you have a bad month or a bad quarter or a bad deal, <coughs> right? Because it's when times are tough, you know wh who your investors really are and whether they're going to back you or not. So, you know, so from our point of view, it wasn't about control. It was about the trust and the relationship and we, where, we, where we in this together right. as equal S partners. So when, when investors are going to invest in you, they often ask to be able to call your customers to do due diligence and find out if what you're saying about your product or the value proposition is true. What do you do about the same on the other side? What did you do to <coughs> diligence the investors? We did not do it well. I mean, not really. No? No, you just need to make sure your, your VCs have a good standing to make sure they will attract a private equity. Okay. Okay, starting with a good VC is be better. A and I realized that everybody knew about uh, Speed Invest. Okay. And a little bit about... So you went Lego. on their reputation yes. alone. Yes, okay. that's very important. Uh, can I add something about the, the relationship and the trust, sure, etc.? Sure, sure. I had two experiences in LBOs, okay? Where buyouts, yeah. Yes, where private equity had the majority ownership, and I found it very difficult because it was stressful. Yeah. Stressful. Although I was providing, a, we made a multiple of 13, one three, yep. which is not bad in the private equity world. I was, and my team, we were stressed, okay? Yeah. While in, in the VC or the private equity in the startup industry now, Yep. I found it more comfortable. Okay. Because the, nobody has the majority. Yeah. It's much better. Okay. Yeah, for, for the diligence, the, the individual investors, what we did was we called other companies that they invested in. Uh, we talked to the CEO there. We also <coughs> tried to find out who they knew through LinkedIn or who they were connected with that we, we might know. So we then we called them as well. So we, we dealt it like we dealt with it like hiring an employee, right? You know, you make reference calls to hire an, like a senior executive on your management team. You don't just take their references on their resume right, or CV. You actually will, you know, do your own diligence. So that's what we did. So the for for the convoy investment, we talked to the chairman of Nutmeg. Okay. okay? He was Partec. He's a he's on the he's a one of the partners in Partec. So we we got information. It wasn't all rosy. But at least we knew what we were getting before we closed the deal. So we made a few tweaks to the deal to uh, cater for certain circumstances. Okay. So all things being equal, right, if you've got two term sheets and one of them's giving you 20% more valuation and you do your diligence calls and you find out that one, right, is, is, has a trouble when there's down numbers. You don't do it. You so don't. You, you lower valuation for better investors <laughs> is a good trade. You also have to remember, as a CEO, you have to look after your own mental health. Because then you mentioned stress. Like you know, you're, when you're the CEO, it's a it is a lonely job. There's only you. Right? you there's nobody else to talk to. Because you don't want to talk yeah. to the VC all the time. <laughs> right? Bringing every problem to them. So, 
I, it, I would definitely go with um, find a better investor, find a better partner. Good. A, a last one on that. If we do not make the, the due diligence, it's because we, I knew the partner. You already had a long standing. Okay, yes. Okay, very good. A long relationship. That's why. A, and Tosca Fund is very supportive. Yeah. And we make sure that we share all news instantly. Mm -hmm. We don't wait the next board meeting to share the news. Oh. Okay. Great long and conversation on how do you govern your and investors. We make sure we send the presentation 10 yeah. days before, et cetera, and you, you keep the trust. Yeah. Okay, uh, last question. Are you going to be around for a little bit in case they have any questions one-to-one? -one? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so we have to wrap up there. I'd like to thank you both for, for sharing your experiences. I'd like to thank you all for listening to us.